Right now on KION News at 6, three suspects remain at large tonight. Three people recovering after being injured in a bank robbery in Carmel yesterday morning. And the latest storm brought much needed rain, but also two near death experiences in Santa Cruz. And will we see any more rain in the forecast? I've got the answer coming up. And high school football players are competing with more than just opponents on the field. They're struggling to get their own team members to play a game. This is KION News Channel 546 at 6. Good evening. Thanks for joining us here for KION News at 6 tonight. I'm Veronica Macias. And I'm Phil Aldridge. Last week's rain event gave the drought-stricken state some much-needed moisture, including in Santa Cruz County, an area that's had two consecutive dry years. KION Stephanie Aceves spoke with the Water Resource Manager for Santa Cruz County about the effects the atmospheric river had on the region. Hey, Stephanie. Hey, Phil. The rain that flowed in over the last few days was powerful, but is it enough to solve the county's drought problems? The water, the water resource manager says no. Sunday's downpour was a force to be reckoned with, causing many issues like power outages, flooding, down power lines, among others. But some people were relieved to see the rain. Honestly, it feels like winters felt like before the drought. You know, when I was growing up, this this is what it felt like all the time. The region received about 5 to 10 inches of rain in just one week, varying slightly from each location in the county. On average, the water resources manager says the area should receive about 30 inches of rain per year, but hasn't received it. Two dry years like that in a row really puts us in a difficult situation um, in terms of both the environmental users of water, our stream flows were critically low, which is terrible for um, endangered species like fish. Um, also, our water supplies were being challenged. For cities like Santa Cruz that rely on surface water, rainfall is needed, but some rely on groundwater, which is accumulated over time. But the water resources manager says there needs to be a constant amount of rain for long periods of time. High rainfall events tend to um, be very flashy and the water all hits the ground at once and just directly runs off into the streams. There's not enough time for it to um, soak into the ground um, in order to get the recharge that we really want. In general, the county's water districts still have water conservation restrictions put in place for citizens. Veronica and Phil, back to you. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, of course, with all that rain, there are power outages too. PG&E says that this week's atmospheric river storm was the largest since 2009, and it knocked out power for more than 630,000 customers in this area. The company says that crews have worked around the clock to restore power. Over 3,000 employees are working safely and quickly, they say, to restore power to those customers still waiting. The utility company restored power to 90% of their customers so far. In Santa Cruz, in the mountains there, the severe weather over the past few days has caused trees to fall and power lines to collapse. Dustin Dorsey spoke with local homeowners and officials after they surveyed the damage. Down trees, closed roads, and snap power lines. The community can only look on in surprise after seeing what has become of their neighborhood following the storm. It can only be described as chaos. We pretty much have two seasons, fire season and storm season, and looks like we're in the storm season all of a sudden. Ziante Fire Chief Dan Walter said the area got more than seven inches of rain in 24 hours, leading to two near deaths from fallen trees and too many calls for fire crews to keep up with. One came from Will Morse. All of a sudden, I heard the cracking and the popping, and you know, you, you know from living here, you know a tree, something's coming, a limb or a tree. And then I heard the whoosh and the boom, and I'm like, oh, crap, you know, I'm like, please don't destroy the home. He is thankful that the damage wasn't too bad. Things like this are just part of the mountain lifestyle. Well, mountain living's not for the meek, you know, the, the faint of heart, and it comes with the territory. But you'd think this wasn't part of the evacuation zone, and I thought everything was cool and apparently not. This is one of many downed trees that hit overhead lines and blocked off roads. County officials say they're still working to clean up the mess even after the rains have stopped. 
The major concern of the county was the flood risk from the CZU Lightning Complex burn scar. Like every major storm in the Santa Cruz Mountains, there is plenty of damage, but everyone is thankful it wasn't worse. Well, Higher elevations in the San Lorenzo Valley got uh, about six to ten inches of rain. We have some road impacts. We have trees down. We have some localized flooding around culverts and things like that. We still have some high surf uh, down by the coast, but other than that, by and large, it looks like we dodged a bullet. Falling trees and debris are still a risk to those driving in the area. Chief Walters advises everyone to slow down and be careful. Well, like that man was saying in Santa Cruz, it comes with the territory. Look at this. The storm, of course, causing a lot of damage like we just heard, but it also brought some beauty along with it. Here's Yosemite Falls roaring back to life after getting a much needed dose of rain. And with that, we'll go to Chief Meteorologist Dan Sianca with what we can expect after the storm moves through. Hey, Dan. Well, hey there, Veronica. It wasn't just rain in the Yosemite, but snow too and heavy snow in the higher elevations. In fact, there's a snowpack. It's been a long time since we've had a snowpack in the Sierra Nevada. It's not even just the Sierra Nevada, even some of the interior coastal ranges. Some of these areas just a month ago were aflame, you know, with fires across the state. But some very high snow totals right now still estimating of four feet snow on the ground in some higher elevation places in the US, in the uh, Sierra Nevada so that is some good news and of course we got quite a bit of moisture here locally as well and just some context on that as well uh, it's Salinas Airport this is uh, one of the lower sites as far as how much precipitation did accumulate uh, over the last couple of days but uh, it's the best has one of the best climate records so it allows me to look back in the past and we take a look at uh, the 1.62 inches of rain that have fallen since July 1st and about 99% of that actually happened within the last couple of days. And that actually puts us at 307% of normal. We should have about a half an inch of precipitation by this time of year. So I think that number, that 307, is pretty good. Between three and 400% for most locations around the Monterey Bay area. Maybe a little bit lower down south where we didn't get quite as much rain. But it's certainly a good soaker and a really good start to our rainy season. We certainly need it. We have a, the, the drought update coming in a couple of days, and this may, be, uh, this, this may show up on the drought update this week. It usually takes a couple of days for that all to percolate through, but we'll have a look at that on Thursday. In the meantime, your forecast through the rest of the week and into the Halloween weekend coming up in just a bit. All right, thanks, Dan. Three suspects are still on the loose after an armed bank robbery in Carmel. The sheriff's office says several people were injured during that robbery at the Chase Bank yesterday. KION's Lisa Principe joins us live from Carmel by the Sea with what we've learned on day two of the investigation. Lisa. Investigators are still on scene here today and the bank remains closed. The sheriff's office says no shots were fired, but there were injuries and the suspects did get away with cash. Three suspects with guns entered the bank yesterday around 917 in the morning, holding people at gunpoint. The suspects fled the scene with cash from the bank, getting away in a red forerunner. Investigators are also looking for a second vehicle they believe is involved. It was an, a legitimate bank robbery. We had three suspects in with guns. There were injuries. Nobody was shot, but there were injuries involved with the robbery, and the people that were injured were treated. And, uh, and then we, will, we pretty much hand it over to the FBI after that point. People have been stopping by all day to visit the bank. The ATM is open, but one woman I spoke to says she also came here yesterday morning. Luckily, it was right after the robbery had already happened. And investigators are still looking for those three suspects involved. The FBI is taking the lead because banks are a federal investigation. In Carmel by the Sea, Lisa Prince KION News Channel 546. Okay, thank you for the update, Lisa. In a health alert tonight, an FDA advisory panel carefully debated and agreed to recommend Pfizer's COVID-19 shot for younger children ages 5 to 11. Final approval from the CDC could come as early as next week. Deborah Alfron has the latest from the White House. An expert panel voted to recommend the FDA grant emergency use authorization of Pfizer's COVID vaccine for kids ages 5 to 11. Out of 18 voting members, 17 voted yes, and we had one abstain. Pfizer says its two-shot low-dose vaccine is 90.7% effective in that age group. An FDA official told the panel young children have not been spared from illness and hospitalization from COVID. And there have also been close to 100 deaths 
making it one of the top 10 causes of death in this age range during this time. The committee heard from those advocating for vaccine authorization. We can protect our school age children immediately and further shield them from short and long term physical and mental health consequences. And from those concerned about possible side effects of the vaccine, including myocarditis, a rare heart condition. Please do not assume that this vaccine is safe in our children until all data, including long-term data, has been carefully evaluated. The White House says it has secured enough doses to vaccinate every eligible child, and that those doses will be going out to pharmacies and pediatricians' offices as soon as the decision is finalized. Moderna says it will soon seek approval for its low-dose pediatric vaccine. Moderna says its vaccine is safe and effective for kids ages 6 to 11. The study of more than 4,700 kids showed the vaccine creates a strong immune response. The majority of adverse effects were mild to moderate, such as fatigue, headache, and fever. Deborah Alfarone, CBS News, the White House. The FDA is still reviewing Moderna's data for kids ages 12 to 17. The Pfizer vaccine is already approved for that age group. The push to vaccinate students against COVID-19 is moving to after-school activities. Students in Los Angeles involved in sports and extracurricular programs face a deadline to get fully vaccinated by the end of this month. As that deadline approaches, the biggest battle the Garfield High School Bulldogs are facing this season is, isn't just on the field. The East Los Angeles school, like others in the district, is determined to stop the spread of coronavirus, even if that means pulling unvaccinated teens from their favorite sport or after school activity. The principal says he's already seen a decrease in positive cases among students since the school district announced its vaccine mandate. We definitely understand that perspective. You know, we're not forcing this on, on anybody. You know, we feel uh, as a district, uh, that's in line with the state and, uh, you know, federal government that vaccination is the clear path to uh, returning to school safely uh, back to normal. According to the CDC, unvaccinated teens are 10 times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19 compared to those who have gotten the shot. Well, staying on the subject of children and teens, coming up lawmakers on Capitol Hill concerned over children's safety online. We have more on two bills they're now considering to help kids stay safe on social media when we come back.